So I'm watching this debate the other night on YouTube. Is God evil? Yeah, yeah, roll my eyes too. Yeah, of course it was the non sequitur guys. Who else do you think is titling a debate like that? Of course it was them. Of course. Now, for the debate to even be titled something like that, or, or right off the bat you know you're dealing with atheists and you're dealing with, you know, not... 100% of the time, but let's say 93% of the time, you are dealing with the Old Testament. Yes, I know, there's a couple, there's the, you know, there's four or five things in the New Testament where Jesus says, ah, Jesus says this, he said, better hate your mother or your father, he can't be my disciple. Yeah, it's really controversial, I know, I read that part too, well, I don't know, I don't know what he meant. But normally, normally, even atheists will give you, though they do not believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, okay? No, they don't. That's why they're atheists. <laughs> no, no, they don't. They don't. They actually don't believe. It. I don't. They don't. But they will give you that some, at least some, if not most, or all of his teachings are quite moral and usually good, and his characters to them seems, on some level, good. Matter of fact, if Jesus isn't God, I can make a very strong case, just based on his teachings and his influence in the world, that he was, if not God in the flesh, at least the greatest moral philosopher of all time. Pretty easily, actually. Who else is even going to come close? Confucius? Lao Tzu? You ever read the crazy stuff Lao Tzu says? Who else? Who else is even going to come close? Can't think of anybody that even would be close. Socrates? So... If Jesus was not God in the flesh, then you could make a really strong argument that he was at least the greatest moral philosopher of all time. So usually when you say, is God evil, you are talking about the Old Testament God. Now, if you're an atheist listening to this, I'm going to assume that you don't think that the Bible was d divinely inspired. <laughs> yeah, call me crazy. I'm just going to assume that. I'm just going to assume you don't think that that was God speaking through human beings. You think it was authored by human beings. So what are the authors trying to accomplish? What are the authors trying to accomplish? With not disguising the fact that this, this, this entity, this being, seems to be at least somewhat temperamental. Well, they actually have a purpose involved. They are establishing, let's again, we're assuming for argument's sake, because we're talking to atheists, that it's human authorship. They are trying to establish the character of Yahweh. They are trying to establish his badass bona fides. They are trying to get you to understand that this is a God not to be trifled with. This is a God you don't want to meet in a dark alley. Yeah, because he's going to smite you. He's going to smite you. You step out of line, you're going to be smoten. They are trying to establish a character that is to be trembled before. It's purposeful in the way they write about him. Now, why? Why? There's concepts that we have lost in our present modern day society. You know, the idea... Now, this has also been distorted if you have been raised in any way fundamentalist. This has been distorted. But the Bible is pretty crystal clear on this. You are supposed to consider ye therefore the kindness and the severity of God. You're supposed to consider his dual nature. It doesn't tell you to trip out about it morning, noon, and night. That's the difference with the fundamentalists. That's what they'll tell you to do. They'll tell you to think about it all the time. You fear God. God's going to get you. God's going to punish you. God's going to get you. Don't. Don't touch your wiener. God's going to destroy you. <laughs> He's going to destroy you. Don't do it. Bah! Now, the Bible actually just says to consider the severity of God. It does kind of go out of its way in the Old Testament to establish him in as kind of a badass, as kind of someone you don't want to play around with. Even Moses himself said, standing before God, I'm filled with fear. If you read the stories in the wilderness where, they, where the mountain that should be not touched with fire, the people cowered in fear before God. They even said to Moses, you go talk, we don't want to talk to him. Well, it's too scary. It's too freaking scary. So they're trying to establish something. The dual nature of God. Consider ye therefore the kindness and the severity of God. Why? Because if you just think about it, that's all it's saying to do. Think about it. Why? Because you're going to protect yourself from yourself. Usually, 99 times out of 100, the person who's going to do the stupid destructive thing in your life that's going to bring harm upon you, guess who? It's you. 
It's you who's going to do it. It's you who's going to choose it. And if you carry around in you some sort of fear of God, that's a guardrail on your soul. That's a guardrail on you. You aren't going to, you might do some of the stupid things, but you aren't going to do all the stupid things. You're going to stop yourself. Why? Because you're considering the severity of God. I don't even want to think about what's going to happen to me if I open up door X. I don't even want to think about, I don't even want to go there. Now this has been distorted in a lot of different ways, but one of the main ways, if you were an atheist, you would, 85% chance you were raised fundamentalist Christian. And you were taught, you know, you were taught fear of God as morning, noon, and night. All, the only thing that the Bible says is fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. How it was taught to you and presented to you is the beginning, middle, and end of wisdom. Is everything about wisdom. Fear of God is the only thing you need to experience. Fear of God. Fear of God. You know, don't go to the bedroom. Fear of God. <laughs> don't turn on the TV. Fear of God. The devil's going to get you through the TV. That's not a healthy relationship with authority, at the very least. It's not. It's not even close. Now, there is actually... Plenty of times in the Old Testament where the Bible t where the Bible shows a different side. We talk about the, God is slow to anger, loving and compassionate, you know, pouring mercy on gen on the generations. There's thousands of scriptures that point to a different side of God, and there's a couple of times in the New Testament where Jesus acts like the Old Testament God. Yeah, there are there are a couple of times. Yes, sweet little Jesus. You, you don't believe me? You know, try lending money in the temple. See what happens. <laughs> lend, try to lend somebody money in the temple. You, what's going to happen? Jesus is going to beat you. Jesus is going to come at you with the whip. Be like, ow, 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 what's going on? Jesus is beating us. <laughs> what do we do? Run. Yeah, because Jesus started, Jesus started acting Old Testament. He got Old Testament on them because they were lending money in the temple. But anyways, the long and the short of the debate Let's just say for argument's sake that the Christian won. Uh, okay, I'm not even going to post the debate. I'm not even going to post it. Why? Well, I'm not. You know, I don't even want to talk about it. I don't even want to talk about the debate. I didn't watch it. I only watched five minutes of it, and I hang, hung my head in shame and said, all right, um, send Stephanie in there. Put Stephanie in there. Anyways, part of the extrapolation of the character of God, though, just, just for argument's sake, if you're an atheist, one of the reasons why we Christians so trip out on the character of God, it isn't just what we're reading in the scriptures. Keep in mind that we are making a, we have made a decision in our heart that the, that the Bible, that the God we are reading about in the scriptures is the actual sovereign living God, creator of heaven and earth. Now that's a decision we made in our heart, but that informs our understanding of his character because then we ascribe to him mult, multiples of benevolence that are outside of the Bible. Everything you see, keep in mind that if we're telling you the truth and this is God is the actual sovereign creator of heaven and earth, then he is the author of mercy itself, the very concept of mercy. His benevolence is unending. Just look at the life around you. So we are, we are giving to him a lot of the benefit of the doubt of life itself, the goodness that we find inherent in life itself. We are ascribing that to the Creator. Now, if you read the Scripture with an open heart, I promise you, if you're an atheist, you can do this too. Start with the book of Matthew. It's not all hate and gay bashing. I promise. It's not. It's not. There's a lot of nice things that get said and a lot of nice, nice ways to treat people in there. It's not all hate and gay bashing. I promise. You know, Christians themselves have done disservice to the Bible by focusing on some of the things that are at the very least, more controversial than the other parts. There are hundreds of parts of the Bible that are actual, benevolent, wise, good instruction that will teach you to be a better person, a more compassionate, caring human being. You know? Um, so I say the answer definitely is no. God is not evil. God is all good. Not everything in the Bible can be easily understood. My personal inclination is it wasn't designed to be easily understood. It was designed to be wrestled with. It was designed for you to, 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 to really think about. You know, ideally pray about. Ideally think about a long time and really try to, try to not easily resolve it one way or the other. 
So, anyways, God is good. All the time. That's how the song goes. All right. Amen. Amen. I tried. Bye.